Welcome to Pirate TV. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the latest United States-sponsored regime change operation in Latin America. And that is the overthrow of the leftist government of Pedro Castillo in Peru. To do this, we're going to feature a presentation by Ben Norton, the editor of the independent news website Multipolarista at multipolarista.com. And I must say, if you're not familiar with Multipolarista, then you need to be checking that out. It is one of the best sources of investigative journalism regarding U.S. foreign policy out there. This video features Ben talking about his recent expose in Multipolarista titled Peru Coup, CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador met with defense minister day before president overthrown. It is now January 1st. A lot has happened in the past two weeks. According to an article in Reuters from December 29th, 28 people have now died due to the uprising and protest of the president's ouster. 22 people killed by police and another six in traffic accidents related to the street blockades. This is a Twitter video of police shooting a protester in the head. Viewer discretion advised. That guy's just been hit. That guy's just been hit. Shit. No. For the time being, protests have taken a break for the holidays, but are expected to start again after January 4th. Let's take a look at Ben's report. Peru's democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo, was overthrown in a coup d'etat on December 7th. And as the time has passed, we've gotten more details about exactly how this coup worked. And one of the most important details to keep in mind is that the U.S. government, which has strongly supported the coup regime and demonized the elected president, Pedro Castillo, who has been arrested without trial, the U.S. government, it, currently its ambassador in Peru, is a CIA veteran, a, someone who worked for the CIA for nine years. Her name is Lisa Kenna. And one day before the coup, she had a very friendly meeting with the defense minister of Peru. And on the day of the coup, he ordered his military to go against Pedro Castillo to not support the president and to support the congressional coup against him. So very, uh, it's a very important fact to consider that the U.S. ambassador in Peru is a veteran CIA agent considering the CIA, of course, has a very long history of backing and organizing coups across Latin America against democratically elected left-wing leaders, going back to 1954 in the coup against Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, or the, the famous CIA coup in Chile uh, on September 11th, 1973, against the elected socialist president, Salvador Allende. So, I published an article about this, and today in this analysis, I'll be mentioning a lot of different sources. The link to every single source I discussed today is included in this article, and the article is in the description below. So you can fact check everything I say and find all of the sources. Now, for those watching, the photo here shows the CIA veteran turned U.S. ambassador in Peru, Lisa Kenna meeting with Peru's defense minister on December 6th, one day before the coup. And you can see the U.S. flag and the Peruvian flag. Now, the fact that the U.S. ambassador in Peru is a CIA veteran has been hidden by the U.S. embassy itself. If you go to the U.S. embassy website for Peru, 
If you go to the bio that's provided of the U.S. ambassador, Lisa Kenna, it doesn't mention the fact that she worked for nine years as a CIA agent. It only talks about her role, her capacity as a diplomat in other countries. And it's noteworthy that she has worked with the State Department and also the Defense Department in countries like Jordan, Egypt, Pakistan. Uh, also, she was involved in efforts surrounding Iraq. So, of course, those are all areas that the U.S. government has significant you know, foreign policy interest in, in the case of the Iraq war, in the case of, um, you know, in West Asia, the so-called Middle East, the U.S. has engaged in many wars and coups and regime change operations. But once again, if you look at her bio at the embassy, it doesn't mention her involvement in the CIA. And that's true, by the way, also for the page in Spanish. Likewise, it doesn't show any information about her involvement in the CIA. In order to find that information, you have to go to an old bio that the State Department provided back in May 2020 when the Donald Trump administration nominated her as U.S. ambassador to Peru. And every time a U.S. administration nominates an ambassador that goes to the nomination, goes to the U.S. Congress, which votes on it. So this is the certificate of competency that the State Department released for Lisa Kenna when she was nominated to be U.S. Ambassador to Peru, and it went to the U.S. Senate or Committee on Foreign Relations. And if you see this bio, most of the bio is, is basically the same as the bio that's on the U.S. Embassy website. The bio on the U.S. Embassy website has two paragraphs. The bio on the State Department website has three paragraphs, and the middle paragraph is excluded from the embassy. Why is it excluded? Because the State Department admits that before joining the Foreign Service, Lisa Kenna served for nine years as a CIA officer, a Central Intelligence Agency officer. So for me, uh, I think this is pretty clear proof that the embassy was trying to hide the fact that their ambassador in Peru is a former CIA agent, because of course, anyone who knows basic history about US-backed coups in Latin America would definitely raise some eyebrows at this fact. Now, let's also talk about the fact that in addition to her work as a CIA agent, Lisa Kenna also worked very closely with Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo was Donald Trump's Secretary of State. He's a hardline neoconservative. And he also was CIA director. And under Donald Trump, uh, Lisa Kenna, the current ambassador to Peru, she served as executive secretary of the State Department and a senior aide to Mike Pompeo. Now, back in 2019, people might know that Mike Pompeo infamously admitted that when he was director of the CIA, we lied, we cheated, we stole, we had entire training courses. Here's this famous quote from the CIA director turned Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Well, as a, this is a bit of an aside, um, but in terms of how you think about problem sets, I, when I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Mm. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's like, we, we, had, we, had, entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, so that was Lisa Kenna's boss. She is now the U.S. ambassador to Peru, where she is overseeing the U.S. support for a coup that overthrew Peru's democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo. Now, I'll, go, I'll come back to that in a second, and I have many more details about the coup today. I've been doing a lot of research and reporting on this. But just to provide a few more details about this, I went through the congressional nomination hearing that Lisa Kenna had back in 2020, you can find this at the website congress.gov. There is a transcript of the, the hearing before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and this meeting was held on July 23rd, 2020, and it, it meant it, the interview with Lisa Kenna. And in this hearing, she's being asked by Senator Bob Menendez, who's a neoconservative Democrat who supports every U.S. coup 
And he's asking her about her work with Mike Pompeo. And he says, let me ask you, as executive secretary of the State Department, you see, essentially, you see essentially all the memos and paper that go to the secretary, correct? He's talking about Mike Pompeo. And she replies, nearly all, yes. So that's her admitting that she saw nearly all of the memos that Mike Pompeo, the CIA director turned secretary of state, saw. And then Senator Bob Menendez continued, and you are aware of the calls coming into the secretary's office and the calls that he makes through you. Is that correct? And Kenna said, I am aware of the vast majority of them. Yes. So this is her admitting in the congressional hearing that she basically knew all of the communication that CIA director turned secretary of state Mike Pompeo had in the Trump administration, which would which means she was involved in the coup attempt in Venezuela the coup attempt in Nicaragua, the successful coup in 2019 in Bolivia. So she knows a lot about coups. And that brings us to her latest involvement in the coup in Peru. Now, there's been a lot of misrepresentation of this coup, a lot of propaganda claiming that it was not actually a coup. In fact, Pedro Castillo was supposedly the one launching a coup. Now, that's sophisticated propaganda, and I'll, I'll talk about why it's misleading and why it's frankly wrong in a second. But before we get to that, we should look at what the actual region of Latin America is saying, because the majority of countries in Latin America have publicly denounced the U.S.-backed coup in Peru and said that it is a coup, an undemocratic coup against a democratically elected leader, Pedro Castillo who's, of course, a left-wing president, like all U.S.-backed coups in Latin America. I have a report at multipolarista.com about the statements made by Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia. They released a joint statement condemning the U.S.-backed coup in Peru and saying that the elected president, Castillo, is victim of anti-democratic harassment. And in addition to them, the government of Honduras the new left-wing president of Honduras, Samara Castro, her government has also condemned the coup in, um, in Peru, and Honduras has declared that it still recognizes Castillo as the real constitutional president. Also, the Chavista government in Venezuela and the government of Cuba have condemned the coup in Peru, and several nations in the Caribbean. So the majority of countries in Latin America have condemned the U.S.-backed coup against Pedro Castillo and called it a coup, recognized it as a coup. That includes the uh, president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador. He said, quote, We consider it terrible that because of the interests of economic and political elites, since the beginning of the legitimate presidency of Pedro Castillo, an environment of confrontation and hostility was maintained against him leading him to, to take decisions that have served his adversaries to remove him. Similarly, Gustavo Petro, who is the new first ever left-wing president of Colombia, he has also condemned what he called a parliamentary coup against Castillo. And furthermore, the leftist president of Bolivia, he has also said that it was a coup. And also the former president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, has said that it was a coup. And of course, Evo Morales in 2019 was overthrown in another US-backed coup in Bolivia. So that brings me to the details of what happened in this US-backed coup in Peru. Now, this photo for people watching shows the CIA veteran turned uh, ambassador to Peru, Lisa Kenna, meeting with the Peruvian defense minister, Gustavo Bovio. And this photo was shared by the Peruvian Defense Ministry on their official Twitter account on December 6th, one day before the coup. And so what happened on December 7th? Now, on December 7th, the Peruvian Congress, which is dominated by corrupt right-wing oligarchs, tried the third congressional coup attempt against the elected president Castillo in just over one year. So President Castillo, he won two rounds of the presidential election in Peru, and he officially entered office on July 28th, 
2021. So he was only in power for a, about a year and a half. And immediately after he entered office, the corrupt oligarch controlled Congress and the corrupt right wing controlled judiciary launched a series of coups, a coup attempts and attacks against him, insanely accusing him of so-called terrorism, using what's called lawfare, judicial warfare, using the courts as a weapon to try to destabilize the elected president. They prevented him from being able to do anything. And in order to understand this, we have to understand that in Peru, the Congress is completely corrupt. Everyone knows that. In fact, there was a famous scandal just a few years ago that has gone on in Peru. That was, it's called the Mamani Video scandal. And in this scandal, the, the right-wing members of Congress were recorded on video bribing other members of Congress to join in their vote. This, this was to prevent the impeachment of a corrupt right-wing president named Kaczynski. So we know we have video evidence proving that the Congress is dominated by right-wing parties controlled by rich oligarchs who literally bribe Congress people to vote for or against impeaching a president. Now, Peru has a constitution that was inherited from the fascist dictatorship that governed Peru from 1990 until 2000 under a U.S.-backed far-right dictator named Alberto Fujimori. And that U.S.-backed dictator committed genocide in Peru. Here's an excerpt from a report in The New Republic, which is a mainstream media outlet, that notes that Fujimori gained international support and USAID funding, that is funding from the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is a CIA cutout. Fujimori gained, that's the dictator of Peru, gained international support and USAID funding for the sterilizations by presenting them at the UN Beijing Conference on Women in 1995. And he portrayed ethnic cleansing as with development rhetoric. The number of indigenous people, they're talking about the sterile, forcible sterilization, well, not all forcible, but mostly forcible sterilization of indigenous people in Peru as part of the so-called family program between 1996 and 2000 is estimated at 294,000 people by Peru's official human rights watchdog, Defensoría del Pueblo. Other estimates are even higher. So a conservative estimate is that the U.S.-backed fascist dictatorship in Peru of Alberto Fujimori committed genocide by sterilizing 300,000 indigenous people, mostly women, but also 22,000 men. And this was funded by the U.S. government. Here's the USAID report. USAID's partnership with Peru advances family planning. So, Alberto Fujimori, the fascist dictator of Peru, was backed by the U.S. as he carried out a war of extermination against the left using the excuse of an armed Maoist group called Sendero Luminoso, which means Shining Path, who were extremely sectarian. In fact, they, they murdered a lot of leftists. So, I mean, but anyway, the, it, th that's a whole other long conversation. Sendero Luminoso, Shining Path, they were a pretty crazy group led by extremely sectarian fanatics who spent a lot of their time murdering other leftists and not focusing on the fascist dictatorship and also terrorizing indigenous controlled areas. But that's that's the point for another day. In fact, some people on the Peruvian left have alleged that the CIA supported Shining Path as a kind of a strategy of tension, just as, for instance, it's, it's likely that the CIA and Italian intelligence backed the Red Brigades in Italy as they kidnapped uh, Moro, who was a kind of like centrist prime minister that was trying to have a diplomatic opening with the Soviet Union. So this was this ultra leftist armed group that uh, killed a, a, you know, center left liberal figure who was trying to open up with the Soviet Union as part of this strategy of tension. And then then the right wing forces can use these attacks to justify cracking down on the left. Anyway, that's a whole long conversation. The point is that Fujimori used the excuse of Shining Path to call anyone who opposed his fascist dictatorship backed by the U.S. a so-called terrorist. And that continues to today. In fact, in the massive protest that we've seen in Peru against the coup regime, the media and the coup regime are calling the protesters terrorists and 
imprisoning them for up to 15 days without trial and, and charging them with organized crime. And we've seen that they have used the term terrorism and said, alleged, that the protesters against the coup are supposedly involved with Shining Path, which basically hasn't existed for 20 years. So it's part of the propaganda narrative that they're using. And, and all of this propaganda narrative goes back to the Fujimori regime, which with the back of the US, backing of the US, which uh, tortured thousands of leftists, killed leftists and disappeared countless people. So the point is that the Fujimoristas still have a significant role in politics in Peru and especially in the Congress. They have significant influence in the Congress and we have video evidence proving that they have bribed other Congress people to go along with their votes in order to have what they call a presidential vacancy. Now, this goes back to the constitution that was created by the Fujimori dictatorship. And this is the official website of the Constitution of Peru, which you can find at congreso.gov.pe. So that's the official website. And this is from the Peruvian government. And this is Article 113, 113 of the Peruvian Constitution. It says that the president of the republic can be vacated, that is removed from office, if it's determined, if the Congress declares that the president has permanent moral in or physical incapacity. So what does moral incapacity mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's extremely vague. What that means is that Congress, which is unicameral, there is one chamber. Congress can remove a democratically elected president if it declares that the president is morally incapable, moral incapacity. And that is exactly what the Congress was trying to do immediately after Pedro Castillo won the election. In, in just over a year, on three occasions, three different times, the Congress dominated by the right wing, controlled by the oligarchy, these corrupt forces that literally bribe Congress people to vote with them. Three times they tried to overthrow Pedro Castillo in a congressional coup. Now, in response to that, what did Pedro Castillo do? do? He, on the third attempt, in order to prevent the coup against him, he invoked Article 134 of the Peruvian Constitution, which says that the president of the, Re the republic has the ability to dissolve Congress if Congress has censured or denied its confidence in two councils of ministers. What does that mean? Council of minister in Peru is the term officially for the cabinet, the presidential cabinet. So the cabinet of ministers. So if the Congress on two occasions has either has taken action against or has denied two different councils of ministers appointed by the president, then the president, according to the Constitution, has the legal right to dissolve the Congress. Now, there have been legal experts in Peru arguing that technically you could argue in court that Pedro Castillo did have the right to do that because of how extremely obstructionist the Congress was against him from day one, waging war against him, against his ministers. His ministers resigned many different times. His prime minister resigned many different times. So now it's, it's a legal gray area. There are legal experts who say that it's not, not applicable. And there are others who say that potentially could be applicable. It would be interesting if there was actually a court, a court case, a, uh, an actual, if Pedro Castillo was given his legal rights and due process, and we were allowed to see this, this court case happen in Peru, of course, that's being denied to him. And instead of giving him a trial, a fair trial, the coup regime arrested him and is now trying to put him in prison for 18 months in so-called preventative imprisonment without a fair trial, without any due process. So what the constitution also says is that if the president dissolves congress the president has to con has to organize elections for a new congress and they need to happen within four months so if you look at the statement that pedro castillo made when he dissolved congress he said that he was going to organize new elections it was only a temporary closure so 
there are there is a very legitimate legal argument. Now again, it's in a gray area. There are people, there are legal experts who say that it's not applicable, but there is a legal argument to be made that what Pedro Castillo did was potentially legal within the Constitution. I'm not an expert on Peruvian law. The point is that regardless of whether or not it was questionably legal or not, he never got a trial immediately in response to him trying to close the Congress in order to prevent the coup against him. What happened? The Congress removed him and there was a coup. Immediately he was arrested without trial and he has been held without trial. That's why there have been massive protests going on in Peru. Huge protests going on, especially in rural areas. Why is that? Because Pedro Castillo is himself a, a very humble teacher and former farmer from a rural area. He's a peasant. He represents the majority of the Peruvian working class who have been ignored and marginalized by mainstream bourgeois politics, which for decades has been dominated by corrupt right-wing oligarchs, rich elites, and they have treated the indigenous population like second or third class citizens with extremely racist policies. I mentioned literal sterilization and genocide against indigenous people. I have uh, a, I translated on my YouTube channel, a video of a Peruvian protester who's a farmer explaining in a, in an interview with a racist right-wing elite who is extremely racist and condescending in, in, in a, um, at a Peruvian media outlet, a TV station. And I'm not going to play the audio because it's in Spanish, but I do have subtitles and I posted the video on my YouTube channel. And this protester says to the media outlet, she says, it is outrageous that you as the Peruvian media do not support us. We are supporting a president, Pedro Castillo, who was elected by the Peruvian people. And then she says this, this, this woman, this Peruvian protester, who's clearly of indigenous descent, like the majority of the population, while she's speaking to a TV presenter who's from a rich, wealthy family of Argentine actors, and she was born in Argentina and then later moved to Peru. And she is herself clearly of European descent. She's very light skinned and she's very racist and condescending against indigenous descendant Peruvians. So the protester says to her, she says, I'm going to tell you something. All my life, those foreigners who have governed us have discriminated against us all of my life. But today it pains them that we are governed by a teacher, a farmer. She's talking about Pedro Castillo, who knows how to eat boiled potatoes, who knows how to eat humble things like us, the farmers. And, and then she says, the protester says, how much do they pay you? How much do they pay you to support the right wing? And the presenter doesn't deny it. She says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much they pay me. That is my own personal issue, not yours. So this shows how racist and condescending the oligarch owned right wing media is in Peru. And it shows the perspective of some of these indigenous descent protesters in Peru who are protesting the imprisonment of their elected president and calling for him to be released from prison. Because again, he never had a trial. He's being held without trial. And this has led to huge protests all across Peru. Here are photos posted by Kausachu News showing some of these massive protests going on, especially in Cusco, which is in the, the mountainous Andean region, which is the main base of support for President Castillo. And there have also been so many videos and photos all over Twitter showing these massive protests and the the brutal, brutally violent repression, brutally violent repression of the coup regime. This is a video. I'm going to mute the audio here. This is a video of protesters in a rural area. Working class protesters, construction workers with their hard hats. Um, calling for the closure of the Congress and, and supporting Pedro Castillo. So if you listen to what working class protesters are saying in Peru, they are supporting the elected president and saying that they wanted the Congress to be closed. Whereas the oligarch owned right wing media and the U.S. government 
are accusing Pedro Castillo of launching a coup, claiming he's a dictator. In fact, the majority of working class Peruvians, especially those of indigenous descent, are supporting him and supporting his attempt to close the corrupt right wing controlled undemocratic Congress. That's why a poll in September showed that the Congress in Peru only has 7% approval in Peru, 7% of the population. So in response to these massive protests, what has the coup regime done? It has used brutal violence to crush the protests. There was a video that went viral showing the police chief in, in an area in Peru telling his heavily armed police, which have military style weapons, telling them, quote, kill or die. He's talking about the protesters. He's saying kill the protesters or die. So this is a fascist dictatorship. And ironically, the U.S. embassy, the U.S. government, the State Department and the right wing media are accusing Pedro Castillo of launching a coup when they're supporting the actual coup. This is an incredible video showing the military forces that were deployed by the coup regime in an area into the streets in Peru in order to crush the protests. This is in the capital Lima, which is one of the areas that the coup regime can actually control because they have a lot of wealthy elites there. But the rural areas are with the president Castillo. And clearly, this is not a democratic regime, this unelected coup regime, because they have to deploy troops to crush the people. And there are so many videos, I'm not going to show them because I'm afraid that, you know, this video on YouTube might be like censored because there are brutal videos showing the coup regime, the police and soldiers shooting protesters in the head. I mean, it's completely brutal. So now this brings me back to what happened with the U.S. ambassador, the CIA veteran, Lisa Kenna. So on December 6th, one day before the coup, she met with the newly appointed defense minister, Gustavo Bobbio. And then one day later, uh, Pedro Castillo tried to dissolve the undemocratic, uh, corrupt, oligarch-controlled Congress, which was clearly a very popular move that he took that potentially could be considered legal according to the Constitution, depending on the legal, legal analysis. So in response, the, uh, the, the retired brigadier general who became defense minister, Gustavo Bobbio, who met with the CIA agent turned the U.S. ambassador in Peru one day before, he released a video on his Twitter account. And in that video, which was, of course, put all over the media, he says that he was resigning in protest and he ordered the military to go against elected President Castillo against his attempt to dissolve Congress. So this was the defense minister who met one day before with the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador to Peru. This was him ordering the military to go against the elected president. And in this video, ironically, he accuses the elected president Castillo of a coup attempt in scare quotes, which is absurd because in reality, he, the defense minister, in collaboration right after a meeting with the U.S. government, was giving the green light for the coup, the actual coup against the elected president Pedro Castillo by the corrupt oligarch controlled Congress that just recently was exposed for bribing Congress people to vote for presidential vacancy. So we know that there's evidence that the corrupt right wing controlled Congress simply uses money from rich oligarchs and corporations to bribe people to vote to try to do a congressional coup to remove the elected president, Pedro Castillo. You cannot say that that, that 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 is democracy. But what was the response of the U.S. government? Surprise, surprise. The U.S. government has supported this coup to the hilt, staunchly, without a single word of criticism of the coup regime. Immediately on the day of the coup against Pedro Castillo, the CIA agent turned ambassador, Lisa Kenna, she tweeted, quote, the United States categorically rejects any extra constitutional act by President Castillo to prevent the Congress from fulfilling its mandate. Now, I already talked about how, according to Article 134 of Peru's Constitution, the president does have the right to dissolve Congress 
if the in cases of obstructionism, if the Congress censors censures or uh, denies two different council of ministers, which you could technically argue that it did against Pedro Castillo. Also, immediately, the U.S. Embassy published a statement with the same language op opposing Castillo and inviting the coup. The U.S. Embassy wrote, the United States emphatically urges President Castillo to reverse his attempt to close the Congress and allow the democratic institutions of Peru to function according to the Constitution. This is the U.S. government meddling in Peru's internal affairs. But what was the point? This was the green light that the U.S. Embassy, headed by a CIA veteran, was giving to Peru's coup regime to launch the coup against Pedro Castillo and to imprison him. And what happened? Immediately, the uh, vice president, who is clearly corrupt and compromised, of Castillo, named Dina Boluarte, she went on the floor of Congress with the backing of the right-wing oligarchs, who are deeply corrupt, and they announced that she would be president, and she immediately gave a speech calling for a government of national unity and a, a uh, truce with the right wing. That is to say, she called for a new, a, gov a new government with the right wing that lost the elections. The right wing lost the democratic elections, but they overthrew Pedro Castillo, the elected president, and made a, a government of national unity with the right wing. And yet the U.S. government called that restoring democracy, and they claimed that Pedro Castillo was the one supposedly carrying out a coup. This is the statement from the top U.S. State Department official overseeing Latin America, Brian Nichols, who's the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. One day after the coup, the U.S. government immediately rubber-stamped the coup and recognized the unelected coup regime of Dina Boluarte and wrote, quote, the United States welcomes President Boluarte and hopes to work with her administration to achieve a more democratic, prosperous, and secure region. He added, quote, We support her call for a government of national unity, and we applaud Peruvians while they unite in their support of democracy. So this is the U.S. government praising the so-called government of national unity with the right wing that lost the election, and then the U.S. says this is democracy. This is classic example, a classic example of a U.S.-backed coup in Latin America. Now, it's not a blatant military coup like under Augusto Pinochet, but it is a congressional coup that is clearly undemocratic, that clearly violates the will of the, Democrat, the democratic will of the Peruvian people, launched by a demonstrably corrupt Congress led by right-wing oligarchs who bribe Congress people to vote against presidents who are elected by the people. And we see clearly that the U.S. government is supporting this at up to the highest levels of the State Department. Not just the CIA agent turned ambassador, but the, the, top, the top levels of the State Department. Now, after, I should also mention that uh, Dina Boluarte, there are people saying, well, well why did Pedro Castillo anoint, anoint, uh, anoint her, appoint her vice president? Because, you know, this, he has responsibility because he appointed her vice president. Well, in reality, I mean, first of all, Pedro Castillo did not control very much because the Congress, with 7% popular approval, controlled by the corrupt right-wing oligarchy, was plotting against him and trying to do a coup from day one. They did three different separate coup, coup attempts from after he entered office in just over a year. The military was against him. The police were against him. The entire media is against him. The media in Peru is controlled by right-wing oligarchs. Every media outlet is like basically Fox News. They're all racist. They call the elected president a terrorist. They accuse him of corruption without any evidence. The judiciary, also controlled by the corrupt right-wing oligarchy, also accused him and his ministers and top officials of completely fake bogus charges. They did not give one second of breathing room, of breathing space to the elected president, violating the democratic will of the Peruvian people. That's why the Peruvian people are out in the streets supporting Castillo and calling for closing Congress and calling for a new constitution so the Congress can't just keep overthrowing the president if they vote that the president is morally incapable. Now, anyway, the point is that Pedro Castillo, he, he did his vice president, Dina Boluarte, 
what was technically his running mate, but what happened? She was expelled from the left wing, the socialist party that Pedro Castillo ran for president on the ticket with, which is called Peru Libre, Free Peru. And she was expelled from that party in January of 2022. And she said that she never agreed with the ideology of the leftist party. So she's clearly a corrupt opportunist who clearly was only part of this party in order to come to power. And now that she was vice president and she was had the opportunity to become president, completely unelected, she joined with the corrupt right-wing oligarchy and the U.S. government to overthrow the elected president, Castillo. And so what happened? A few days after the coup, on December 13th, the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador to Peru, Lisa Kenna, she met with the so-called president, Boluarte, who was not elected. And this is what the U.S. ambassador said. She said, I met with President Boluarte to reiterate the compromise of the U.S. in the defense of democracy. Democracy. The U.S., the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador is claiming that the U.S. is defending democracy by supporting an unelected coup regime featuring corrupt oligarchs that have always violated the will of the, the Peruvian people and had 7% approval. This is what the U.S. calls democracy. Same old, same old. Furthermore, after the CIA agent turned ambassador met with the unelected coup leader, Boluarte, once again, Brian Nichols, the coup plotting assistant secretary of state who oversees Latin American affairs in, the, in Washington, this coup plotter, Brian, Brian Nichols, he, he tweeted, quote, we support the Peruvian people and their constitutional democracy. Once again, this is what the U.S. calls democracy, the greatest so-called democracy that you can buy, that corporations and corrupt right-wing oligarchs can buy. Meanwhile, while the U.S. is calling this democracy, the vast majority of countries in Latin America are opposing this coup, including on the same day that the U State Department made this, this ridiculous comment, the governments of Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia released a joint statement condemning the coup and recognizing Pedro Castillo and saying that he's a victim of anti-democratic harassment. So the, the, the governments in Latin America, Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Colombia, Honduras, Venezuela, Cuba, Caribbean nations, they have come out against this coup. Basically, the only governments that haven't come out against it are the corrupt right-wing U.S. puppet regimes, like in, in Brazil under the fascist Jair Bolsonaro, who was himself installed through a CIA-backed coup, or the right-wing multimillionaire banker in uh, Ecuador, Guillermo Lasso, who's also deeply corrupt and has millions of dollars of property in Florida and is closely linked to U.S. intelligence as well. So, I mean, this is the actual coup. The U.S. claims to be defending democracy while it is carrying out, it is backing a coup. And finally, the State Department continues to talk about democracy. And we see another example of how the CIA and the State Department are basically the same institution. So on December 13th, the same day, the State Department held a press briefing with its spokesperson, Ned Price. Who is Ned Price? He is a former CIA agent, a CIA veteran, just like the CIA veteran turned U.S. ambassador to Peru. Uh, Ned Price is a CIA veteran. So now he's the spokesperson of the CIA, excuse me, the, the Secretary of State, basically no difference, uh, of the State Department. And no, the spokesperson for the State Department, which is basically not any different from the CIA. And in this press briefing, a journalist asked what this, this situation of what if the U.S. supports the new coup regime in Peru and CIA agent turned State Department spokesperson Ned Price said, quote, we do commend, not condemn, commend, that is praise. We praise Peruvian institutions and civil authorities for safeguarding democratic stability. He says the people of Peru deserve stable democratic institutions that follows Peru's constitution and carry out mandates of democratic governance. This is the U.S. claiming to support democracy while supporting an undemocratic coup in Peru. And then he says, 
the only he doesn't condemn the coup regime, which is murdering protesters. They have killed at least eight protesters and injured dozens. And they're imprisoning protesters without trial for up to 15 days and calling them terrorists and accusing them of organized crime. But the U.S. State Department doesn't condemn the actual dictatorship in Peru that it supports. Instead, it condemns the protests. The CIA analyst turned uh, State Department spokesman Ned Price says, we are troubled by scattered reports of violent demonstration and by reports of attacks on the press and private property, including businesses. Oh no, who's gonna think of the private property? That's what the US government, it's the only thing the US government cares about. It doesn't care about poor indigenous Peruvians being murdered by the coup regime that it supports, just as the US supported the coup regime in Bolivia in 2019. This is very similar. And then the State Department spokesman, CIA veteran said, quote, when it comes to Peruvian President Dina Boluarte, we of course do recognize her as such. We will continue to work with Peru's democratic institutions, and we look forward to working closely with President Boluarte and all branches of government in Peru. So this is very similar to the U.S.-backed right-wing coup in Bolivia in 2019. When the coup regime backed by the U.S. in Bolivia was massacring indigenous protesters, the U.S. supported it. And similarly today, the U.S. is supporting the coup regime in Peru as it massacres indigenous protesters. It, the, the Trump administration supported the coup in Bolivia and the Obama, the, the, excuse me, the Biden administration is supporting the coup in Peru. This is bipartisan imperialism. And the U.S. claims to be supporting democracy while destroying democracy. This is a classic age-old tactic that the CIA has carried out dozens of times against pretty much every left-wing leader in Latin America. More recently, I mentioned the 54 CIA coup in Guatemala, the 73 CIA coup in Chile. There are many more examples. But then you also have, more recently, the U.S.-backed coup in Honduras in 2009, the U.S.-backed soft coup in Paraguay in 2012, the two U.S.-backed soft coups in Brazil in 2016, removing the elected president of the Workers' Party, Dilma Rousseff, and then the, the, the U.S.-backed coup in 2018, imprisoning Lula da Silva, preventing him from being presidential candidate, which that was the way in which the U.S. installed fascist Bolsonaro as president of, of Brazil. And immediately after, Bolsonaro and the, the judge who imprisoned Lula on fake charges, Sergio Moro, he and Bolsonaro visited Virginia and they went to CIA headquarters, thanking the CIA for supporting the coups. So this coup that we see in Peru today is similar to the kind of political congressional coup that we saw in Brazil in 2016 and 2018, using lawfare, judicial warfare, using media, fake news and attacks, using the Congress to launch a coup. It's also very similar to the coup that the US backed in April of 2022, against the democratically elected prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Once again, this is, this is the new era of hybrid war backed by US imperialism. The US government backs undemocratic coups through corruption and bribery and, and media propaganda and using the Congress controlled by corrupt right-wing oligarchs who bribe people or the judiciary controlled by corrupt judges and prosecutors who conspire with the right-wing opposition like we saw in Argentina with another U.S.-backed uh, a judicial coup in Argentina against the former president and current vice president, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner. So the U.S. government continues to, to support these coups, and they're, they're a more sophisticated kind of coup. They're the coup in the, they're the, the kind of coup in the era of hybrid warfare, but they're still coups. The U.S. government and the corporate media claim that Pedro Castillo was trying to launch a coup to cover up the fact that they were the ones that actually carried out a coup. And now they're trying to solidify the coup regime's control and power in Peru by massacring protests or protesters. And while the coup regime has declared a state of national emergency for 30 days, suspending civil liberties, while well, it has sent out soldiers and police to murder protesters, the U.S. State Department is 100% supporting this undemocratic coup regime in the name of democracy. That's the dystopian world that we're in today. And 
actually, basically, the majority of countries in Latin America have rebelled against this coup, which is being supported by the U.S. government. And many countries in the region, including most of the most populated, most populous countries in the region, have condemned the coup and have continued standing with the elected Peruvian president, Pedro Castillo. I actually made a graph showing the countries in the region that are supporting Peru's president going against this U.S. coup, this U.S.-backed coup. Now, if you look at the graph, which I will, in the, in the description below, I will link to all of the sources that I cite today. You can see that the governments of Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Honduras, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and numerous Caribbean nations, including Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbuda, um, St. Lucia, St. Lucia, many countries in the Caribbean and about half of, more than half of the countries in Latin America have publicly opposed this coup backed by the U.S. and Peru and have publicly expressed support for the democratically elected president, Pedro Castillo. Now, in terms of the most populous countries in Latin America, this is even more significant. This is a graph showing the most populous countries in Latin America. Now, Brazil is the largest country. So Brazil still has, until January 1st, 2023, a far-right government led by Jair Bolsonaro, who's very pro-US, and he has expressed support for the coup in Peru against the left-wing president, Pedro Castillo. But if you look at the subsequent countries, the most populous countries in the region, most of them support Pedro Castillo, including Mexico, which is the second most populous country, the third most populous country, Colombia, the fourth most populous country, Argentina, the fifth most populous country in Latin America is Peru, the sixth most, sixth most is Venezuela. So among the six largest countries in Latin America, excluding Brazil, all of the other ones support Pedro Castillo. This is an example of a significant historic rebellion against a U.S.-backed coup. But I also want to look at some of the statements made by the unelected coup regime in Peru. This is a tweet from the presidency of Peru, the official account, and it shows the unelected coup leader, Dina Boluarte, boasting that on December 16th, she had a phone call with the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who reiterated the support of the U.S. government for the coup regime in Peru. And this was also confirmed in a statement published by the U.S. State Department on December 18th. And it's a very, and this is also, by the way, I should point out, this is very strange diplomatically. This is the readout, right? Or the minutes of a meeting. Usually if the State Department publishes the readout after the Secretary of State has a discussion with the foreign minister of another country or a foreign leader, they publish the readout immediately after the call, either the same day or a day after, right? It's very strange to have a readout that is published two days after the call. So there was, there was a delay. But anyway, the point is that in this statement that is attributable to the spokesman for the State Department, who is also a CIA veteran, Ned Price, and don't forget what they say about CIA uh, CIA, former CIA agents never really being former. Anyway, so the CIA agent turned State Department spokesperson Ned Price said that U.S. Secretary of State Blinken spoke on December 16th with the newly appointed Peruvian, Peruvian President Dina Boluarte. They don't mention that there was a coup against the elected president, Pedro Castillo. They don't mention that Dina Boluarte has never won a single vote in a presidential election. They don't mention that Dina Boluarte's coup regime has killed two dozen protesters in the, in the days since the coup against Pedro Castillo on December 7th. They don't mention the hundreds of protesters that have been wounded. They don't mention the fact that this U.S.-backed coup regime suspended civil liberties in Peru and imposed a state of national emergency and 
according to Peru's own human rights, official human rights watchdog, which is technically autonomous from the government, they admitted that the Peruvian coup regime of this U.S.-backed leader, Dina Boluarte, has sent out the military to flood the streets of Peru to attack protesters. That's why at least 25 protesters have died. And these are, of course, largely indigenous descent, poor and working class protesters. And they don't mention that. Uh, and the human rights watchdog in Peru admitted that the Peruvian coup regime is using heavily armed police and military who are, who are in helicopters shooting protesters with live ammunition and tear gas bombs from out of helicopters. So the U.S. government, the State Department doesn't mention any of that. The brutal, violent repression of these protests against the coup in Peru. Instead, the State Department says, Secretary Blinken encouraged Peru's institutions and civil authorities to redouble their efforts to make needed reforms and safeguard democratic stability. There is no democracy right now in Peru. The government is unelected. It is a coup regime. The United States looks forward to working closely with President Boluarte on shared goals and values related to democracy, human rights, security, anti-corruption, and economic prosperity. So they talk about democracy and human rights. Well, the coup regime backed by the U.S. is literally killing, massacring protesters. So why are people, why are so many thousands and thousands of Peruvians flooding the streets protesting? They have three main demands. One, the release of President Pedro Castillo, the elected president, who has been imprisoned for 18 months on so-called preventative prison charges without a real trial, without due process. This is, this is a complete dictatorial process. The other demand is new elections as soon as possible. And then the most important demand is that millions of Peruvians are demanding a new constitution to replace the anti-democratic constitution created by the right-wing, far-right dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori, a fascist dictator who destroyed all democratic institutions in Peru and created a new constitution without real democratic support. And that is the constitution that was inherited. That's why the Congress, the unpopular, corrupt, oligarch-controlled Congress can keep launching these coups against elected, democratically elected presidents.